three phases of your leadership. So you've heard yes. about the first two. So we want to get to the third one now. Okay. Yeah. The third and current. Yes. <laughs> current third phase. and current phase. Maybe the last one. Yes. <laughs> Um, yes, yeah, so how did this start? As I've said, I've been at the PHLC now for more than 15 years. Mm -hmm. I, I became the executive director in 2017. And we had just finished, um, yes, mm. I think I just finished 11 years at, at the center. Mm. So really postdoc 2006 and then executive director in 2017. Mm. Um, I don't know. I've it was a remarkable journey it's it is a remarkable journey to mm. certain extent and i think as i've said mm. my growth was really fast mm. and um mm. uh, supersonic to certain mm. extent mm. and so um how did this start so i think i've mentioned how like the second phase we're in this um, phase of growth as an organization lots of challenges growing pains um first growth comes with its own other issues that sort of compound you know, other institutional uh, challenges that are there. Mm. And then uh, um, at that time, uh, so I, I moved from theme leader of health. Mm -hmm. and that was really my beginning. Mm. And then I had a lot of interest in policy engagement and communications. Mm. And it's one of the things which attracted me to APHRC mm. because right from inception, APHRC has already said that there's greater value for science and research mm. beyond what we get from the academic, exactly. uh, you know, yeah. circles yeah. where you publish your papers and they get cited and mm. then you get, you know, mm. all these things, mm. citation indices and all that. I worked somewhere where we used to call it RPP model, research <laughs> into policy into and practice. practice. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So that is something which even when I came, it was mm. very attractive. Mm. And as an institution, we've been struggling really hard to mm. figure out what is the best way of making that happen. Mm. Not just saying it. Mm. but also like keeping beating ourselves up mm. until we get it right. Mm -hmm. So that interest in um, policy and and communications, um, I remember one time we were doing a strategic plan mm. and then I kept on asking, why do we keep this vision mm. if we don't want to like actualize it? Mm. And then when you go into senior management meetings, oh, there was always tension. The PC team, policy and and communications team is complaining how researchers don't want to do media interviews. They don't want to do this. They don't want to go to the community. They don't want to... And people are like, yeah, me, I'm a researcher and we would keep on going around. And it's like, it's in our vision. So why, why do we keep it? If we don't want to do it, then we should take it out. But then we should not keep on pretending that we want to do this, that we articulate in our vision and mission. And then in practice, we don't want to take it up. So based on that really passion, I would say for policy and communications, mm. at some point I was made the interim head of the policy and communications mm. team. Mm. Um, at that time, it was still small, really playing a supportive role for research. So like working with researchers and finding forums and mechanisms of communicating our work and, mm. you know, um, hosting events, publishing, all mm. that. Mm. So it was a small team, mm. but um, I was leading the health team mm. and I was the interim head mm. of policy and media and communication. Mm -hmm. So I had two hats. And that was very eye-opening because as in that role, I, I went for some training and I was like, wow, we were not doing enough. There's more that we can do. Mm. But what that role did was now to make me a member of the executive leadership team. Mm. So there was the executive director and then the heads of the division. Uh -huh. So I was head of PEC, mm. then there was the head of research, mm. then there was the executive director, and then the head of mm. operations. Mm. So now in terms of the leadership structure, mm. this is like the top decision-making body at the center mm. uh, before the ED. Mm. So now that takes you, as I said, into different <laughs> um, parts of the organization, which mm. is involved board mm. and, you know, meeting mm -hmm. partners and yeah. funders. Yeah. So you start engaging really um, in different forums. Mm. So the board really was one of the, mm. you know, one of the main ones mm -hmm. where I was engaging. Mm. So now, of course, we're there, as I've said, um, on the outside growth, success, but then on the inside, like some kind of Challenges challenge, too. some yeah. negative mm. energy, mm. some kind of unhealthy dynamic mm. and success at a huge cost mm. to people, mm. um, especially from the work life balance mm -hmm. perspective. Mm. And now I think it was 2016 mm. uh, during the board meeting. Mm. <clears throat> um, <laughs> mm. We usually go for the board meeting and then there's a closed session, then mm. the board now invites the executive director, and then 
uh, he comes to brief us. Mm. This time, mm. he was there for like 20 minutes and then he calls us. We're like, what happened? Because we used to attend the board as, this, as the as leadership team would sit in the board meeting. Mm. Then when they would have the closed session, they would send us out and then, you know, talk to the ED and then the guy would come. It would take like an hour, an hour 15 minutes. This time it took like 20 minutes. So the guy calls us. They like, um, so he comes, I'm saying, yeah, you see, FHLC, we are now in our 17th year, and I don't know, the institution has grown. We're like, why is this leading? Where's this take? <laughs> Where's this guy leading? Mm. And then at the last thing, he drops the bombshell. I've informed the board of my intention to resign. Oh my yeah. God. Like this was, um, I think, in terms of how I feel, it's going back to, we have an Ebola case in Barara, in, Bar in the Barara Hospital. Like the sinking feeling that you get. And I think like I was seated down, but I feel like I need to sit down, even though I'm seated. But like what? He said, I've, I've informed the board that I'm resigning. I'm like, oh my God. And now like my mind goes into overdrive and I'm thinking about the disaster that is going to strike yeah. once this person leaves because he had been there since APHS like became an time independent. Memorial, yeah. He was founding director. He was the founding director. Mm. 2001 now, this is 20, I think it was 2016, mm. November. 15 years of solid yeah. leadership, yeah. <clears throat> and I mean, APHS was there before it mm. became a, an independent organization. So he was there as if when it was a program. So he has And he was history. heading the program. So yeah. I think he had been there for 18 years, you know. I'm like that sinking feeling of like, okay, I'm just trying to like skip ahead five years from now. There'll be no APHLC. There'll be like a disaster. <laughs> like, oh, we are going to close, sell this building. Mm. I'm like imagining the worst nightmare. Mm. I was like, what? 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 He said, no, I've been thinking about this for some time and I don't know what and the family. And I'm like, okay, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think I want to think about this. <laughs> I think for like three days I couldn't sleep. Mm. I was like, disaster, disaster mm. has mm. struck. Mm. And so, you know, after that, of course, we, you know, we recover and then the body is always draining and exhausting. So you're recovering from the body itself and then we are recovering from this news. Mm. And um, oh, my God. Then, was, of course, we start talking. The end of year was coming. We're doing the end of year performance review. Mm. And it's like, I hope you're going to apply for this position. I was like, who? He said, you. I said, uh -uh, no, <laughs> I have no intentions whatsoever of applying for this position. It's like, why? Why? It's like, I said, I'm not ready for it. He said, no, you're ready. I said, I'm not. I'm not ready for this. It's like, okay, uh, wow. If I'd known that you're not ready, I wouldn't have resigned. I was like, what? You should have told me <laughs> that you thought I was ready. <laughs> you didn't. Um, I, I mean, he never. He was never explicit about it. But of course, in retrospect, I can say, yes, perhaps he, there, was, there were several things that I could see. Maybe he had me Same. in his succession plans. Mm. But he was never explicit about them. Mm. And so it's only later it's like, okay, maybe it should have been clear, but it wasn't. And I said, no, I'm not, I'm not applying for this position. Because as I've said, for me, it was a nightmare. Like, what's going to happen? You know, going back to the issues of the pressure for fundraising, you know, you rely on a lot of partners, long-term funders, long-term partners. And you need some kind of relationship with those people. I didn't have any relationship with any of our major funders. So that was the thing on my mind, like all the funders are going to run away and then we are going to like, the fund is going to dry up and we are dead, finished. Um, okay, so the process starts, you know, they get a search firm and they advertise and they shortlist and they start interviews. And I had not applied actually for that position. <clears throat> So <laughs> interestingly, the I was, had traveled to London <laughs> and then I received a call from the person who was on the search farm, the farm which had been retained. Mm -hmm. Said, do you have a minute? Yes. Okay. I want to talk to you. I said, okay. So he said, the search committee has sent me to talk to you. And I said, okay, about what? He said, they think that you should apply. By then they had gone. I think they got like 150 applications. They whittled them down, whittled them down to 70 to 20 something. And they were like at the last seven or eight. So why? <laughs> so it's like, why did you not apply for this position? This this search firm had helped us recruit some other senior position. Mm. He said, I've interacted with you and I was shocked that you didn't apply. I said, why did you think I would apply? Then he's like, um, why not? Then he told me something. He said, you know, for women, you want to check all the boxes. For men, they're like, 
what is the worst that can happen? <laughs> So trust me, the people who have applied for these positions, perhaps you you have a stronger profile than they than they do. But I know that in your mind as a woman, you want to be sure that you check all the boxes. Mm. And I'm like, okay, that's true. Because I've I've looked at the 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 requirements and I don't have, I don't know, 15 years of I don't know what, because I've been there for eleven years. I don't have 15 years, I don't know, I don't have this, I don't have this. It's like that's the problem. Just apply. Like, what's the worst that can happen? The, the worst that is you don't get selected. I said, but that's bad as well. He said, what's bad about it? Like, what's going to change in your life if you don't get selected? I was like, okay. I said, okay, this is this message. The message is, the committee thinks that you have a stronger profile than all the candidates that they've seen so far. But of course, you've not reached the point of the interview. So apply. And um, if there's a stronger candidate than you, then let's assume you're the benchmark. So at least they will know that they've still got somebody who's better and stronger than you are. At least everybody will be comfortable because then, the, we can, can go against each other. You can actually compare mm. and see. But if you don't apply, we'll never know that. We oh. we have an under, we have some kind of understanding of your skills and your strength and your what. But it would be nice to like do a side by side comparison so that the committee is comfortable that we know that they are selecting is stronger than you. But for now, they don't think. Whoa! I was like, what? Now, coming, said, coming after uh, that phase two of your, <clears throat> which, which was a bit of a turmoil, yeah. that must have made your head feel a bit... Actually, I wasn't even aware of mm. phase two. Oh, yeah. This is now reflection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You're I now think phase two became backwards. clear to me now when I was taking Much up this, this position. Okay. I wasn't even aware that this is what had right. been happening. Because okay. I said on the outside, really, everything was everything great. Everything was looking good. You okay. know? Mm -hmm. So I'm like, let me think about this. So of course I called my husband. He's like, "What? Say no. If you to apply, they should guarantee that you'll <laughs> keep the position." I said, "They can't do that." He said, "No, but why? They, why would they ask you to apply if they're not going to give you the position?" I said, "No, I don't think they can. They can say that apply because you're guaranteed. This, the policy has to go through. So I'll accept to be a benchmark. And honestly, I felt like it would be better for the organization if we got an external person. Honestly, in my, in all honesty, that's what I felt because." Mm. I said, okay, I've been in this post, in this system for 11 years and I'm sure there are amazing things that happen out there. So we need people who come with fresh eyes, fresh ideas, fresh, fresh ideas and fresh oh. different perspective and they can come and the institution can only be better for it. If we get somebody who can come and really bring new blood and what, like why not? That's what I felt like it was better to get somebody else. So, but in any case, I didn't feel like I was prepared for this position. So long story short, I apply. I do a Skype interview. Then I say, okay, you've moved to the final face-to-face -face interview. And I show up for the face-to-face -face interview. And in the evening, I get a call and it's like, hey, you are a preferred candidate. I'm like, oh my God, what mm -hmm. did I just do? What did I just do? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, what was I thinking? Now the whole anxiety that I had had before, which I'd sort of taken out of my head because I wasn't in the running for this position. Now everything comes back. Mm. I was like, we are doomed. <laughs> 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 um, but anyways, I'm here. So maybe I'll be the APHRCED that runs it into the ground. Oh, and so, okay, so what's, okay, whatever. Oh, um, I'll goodness. just go get another job or something. <laughs> so uh, the dooms, like the doom, dooms the feeling came it, back. Yeah. And then by a stroke of luck, maybe not stroke of luck, something which is maybe normal. Mm the committee recommended that I should go for leadership training. Mm. And um, they even, there's a, a, a group in the US that does this, it's called CCL. Mm. And I think that was one of the best five days I've ever spent in my life. Mm. <laughs>